My tongue doesn't work anymore. You're a scientist. Think like a scientist. Uh, uh. True and integrity. Uh. Let's develop some. Uh. And you're six. <laughs> <laughs> Too many sciencey words. Welcome back to my channel, my friends. I just washed my hair and now it's not behaving. <sighs> Today, I thought that we would delve into some of the most common fitness myths and misconceptions that we've all been told or believed at some point and unpack the science behind them. And I've done some digging so you don't have to. So let's just jump right in. The first thing that I hear all the time is that fats are bad for you. And all I can say is, <sighs> Let's get some nutritional education going on here. Fats play a really, really important role in so many physiological functions, such as the formation of most cell membranes, the formation of myelin sheaths. They facilitate the transportation, storage, and use of fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. They provide protection to your internal organs and assisting in enzyme regulation. So it's safe to say that we need fats for everyday life. And when it comes to dietary fats, there are four different types that we look at. Saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and trans fats. And I'll give you a little rundown of each of the fats and the foods you might associate with them, just so we're on the same page. So saturated fats are the bad boy of the group. And that's foods such as butter, animal produce, dairy, and eggs. Despite being a type of unhealthy fats, they're actually vital for a healthy diet. They enhance liver function, provide energy and structural integrity to the cells, and enhance the function of the immune system. Then we have monounsaturated fats, which are foods such as olive oil, avocado, most nuts, and peanut butter. Now we use these mostly in cooking and are generally seen as healthy fats, but it's really important that when using monounsaturated fats such as olive oil, that we don't overheat them. When we overheat them, they tend to lose their healthy properties. So for example, if you're cooking with olive oil, make sure that you don't let it smoke and you keep it on a relatively low heat to retain all of its health benefits. Polyunsaturated fats are the heroes of the group and tend to be consumed raw to maximize their health benefits. These fats are a really, really important part of a healthy diet and are known as essential fatty acids or EFAs for short. EFAs can then be subcategorized into two categories, omega-3 and omega-6. And you'd find them in foods such as oily fish, walnuts, extra virgin olive oil and sunflower seeds. They're really important in the body for the regulation of inflammation, mental function, as well as developments of the hair, skin and the immune system. And finally, we have trans fats. And when people talk about bad fats, this is most likely the group that they're referring to. These occur in nature and when consumed in small amounts, they actually don't pose any real health issues. However, many man-made and processed foods result in an abundance of these being formed and consumed. These are foods such as margarine and vegetable oil spreads, biscuits, cakes, sweet treats, pastries, and anything that's labeled low fat foods tends to fall into this category as well. Basically, the foods that we love but we know are bad for us tend to fall under the trans fat category. Overconsumption of these trans fats is really strongly linked to immune system dysfunction, bone and tendon weakness, coronary heart disease, high cholesterol, and a whole range of other health problems. Problems. So actually, when we think about the phrase, fats are bad for you, we need to really delve into what type of fats we're talking about and understand that actually there are many fats that are essential for our daily human function. So not all fats are bad. Even the bad fats aren't bad. And when talking about nutrition, it's really important to be aware of what we're consuming, to know about the nutrients and the makeup of the foods that we're eating, and to remember that foods aren't bad. Everything should be consumed in moderation. If you have ever believed that you can get abs from doing loads of core workouts, raise your hand. If you're truly telling me that you haven't believed this at some point, or you haven't tried working your core every single day in order to get abs for the summer, then fair play, son, because the amount of times that I've been caught up in this, even though I know this is not true, I still, still used to find myself working out core so often in the lead up to summer to try and get abs. And it doesn't work like that. And before we delve into this, I just wanna start out by saying, having abs does not mean that you are the pinnacle of health and fitness. The look of abs is something that society has drilled into us as the most attractive body type. And we've been fooled into thinking that if you don't have abs, you are not the fittest you could be. And that having abs means you are at absolute peak physical fitness. But truthfully, having abs doesn't mean you're healthy. And you definitely, definitely don't need to have abs to be strong and fit and reach all of the goals that you've set yourself. You might have heard the saying, abs are made in the kitchen. 
kitchen. And to an extent, this is definitely true. So the science behind it is that abs and ab definition are seen when the body has a very low percentage of fat. And essentially, there's very little fat across the abdominal muscles, which allows them to just peek through. So in order to get abs, you need to be lean. And the easiest way to do this is through diet. It's the age old tale of calories in versus calories out. And being in a caloric deficit is how you lose weight. You must be consuming less calories than you are expending or expending more energy than you are consuming. It's as simple as that. Essentially what I'm saying is you could do core exercises every morning for an hour a day, but if your diet is not clean, healthy, and if you're not in a calorie deficit, it's going to be very hard for you to become lean enough to get abs and to be able to see them. However, just because core exercises don't necessarily mean that you will see your abs, doesn't mean that you should stop training core. Having a strong core just generally allows you to stabilize your body and increases your balance whilst reducing the risk of lower back pain. So getting abs is really a mixture of having a strong core and a low percent body fat. So build with training and reveal with diet. The next one is something I don't think we're ever explicitly told, but it's something that's very prevalent throughout social media, through influencers, through companies trying to sell you specific products. And that is that there are specific exercises that can reduce fat in certain places. I used to believe that if I did this influencer's five tips to get rid of your love handles, that I'd suddenly have the perfect physique. Or that if I listened to the three ways to get rid of hip dips, I'd have an hourglass figure. And I genuinely thought that if I followed this, that I would end up looking like the model on screen that it has so obviously worked for. And I really want to address this in two ways. So firstly, let's talk about the scientific evidence behind this. You cannot target fat loss. You cannot spot reduce fat. You cannot choose where you're going to burn fat. The body burns fat however it pleases from wherever it wants to. And it's different for all of us. And unfortunately, it's not something that we can ever control. So just like we spoke about with abs, doing certain exercises for different muscles or body parts does not mean that you'll necessarily lose fat and tone up there. What you will find is that you will build muscle in these areas, gain some strength, and also potentially contribute towards your caloric deficit by expending more energy, which in turn might help you to lose fat and body weight in itself. What it will not do is burn body fat in those specific areas. And for example, get rid of your love handles or sort your hip dips. And that's just science and it's just how the body works. The second part of this that I quickly wanted to address is the emotional side of wanting to fix all of our insecurities. Firstly, you know that I am a huge advocate of being your own biggest fan and self-confidence and self-love and all of those cringy things. Physically, mentally, on a fitness level, on a work level, across all levels in your life, you have to be the one cheering yourself on first and foremost. And if you haven't watched my video on how to achieve that, I will leave the link in the description box below. So go and check that one out too. I know it sounds cringy, but it's so, so important to love your body and love yourself for all of your great things and for all of your flaws. Society has created this perfect image of what we should look like. Photoshop and influencers with too much time on their hands have set this unrealistic body type that normal, natural people physically cannot live up to. And those influencers and celebrities may not have obvious imperfections, but you know who does? Me, and you, and normal, natural, hardworking people like you and I. We have hip dips, we have stretch marks, we have love handles, we have all the jiggly bits. And the sooner we can learn to love and embrace them, instead of spending every moment that we can trying to fix them, the better. Start to celebrate your body for what it can do. Start to celebrate your flaws and your imperfections, as well as all of the things that you love about yourself. And remove the negative association that you have with said flaws. And remember that most of the people that you see on social media don't look like that in real life. This myth is something that I've never ever questioned before recently, and was actually what gave me the idea for this video. And that is that eating celery burns calories. But now it's time to actually unpack the science behind this because if you, like me, don't like celery, this one is gonna make you feel a lot better. And if you do like celery, I'm sorry, but you also, that's gross. Lots of veg tends to be relatively low in calories and are more nutrient dense than calorically dense, which means that they are very high in nutritional value compared to their caloric value, which is a great thing. Processed foods and junk foods are more calorically dense than nutrient dense, which means that they are high in calories compared to the nutrient makeup. So the idea behind this myth is that celery is actually negative calories because you burn more calories whilst eating it than you consume from the celery itself. 
which if you don't think too hard about it, could make sense. Celery is super healthy, it's full of water, it's disgusting, so it's probably really good for you. So personally, I never gave it a second thought. And the reason behind this is that I knew that in order to chew and digest your food, you are expending energy and burning calories. And since some foods like celery are so low in calories, it kind of made sense that you could possibly be burning more calories than you were actually ingesting. And although theoretically this might be possible, when you put this into practice, it doesn't quite make so much sense. So through digestion, the amount of calories burnt varies from different food groups. For example, the digestion process burns a higher percentage of calories when digesting protein than it does vegetables. And generally, the amount of calories that we burn through chewing and digestion is so small that it's not really enough to make a difference and to create negative calorie foods. In order for this to happen, the calorie content of the food would have to be incredibly low, you would have to chew for an incredibly long time, and the food would need to have the nutritional makeup that requires a high percentage of its calories to be burnt during digestion, such as protein. For foods that are mostly made up of protein, their calories are not low enough to do so. And for the foods that do have minimal calories, the percentage of calories burnt through digestion is not high enough to make a difference. So long story short, eating foods that burn more calories than you consume is very unlikely to happen even with celery. Although celery is still a great low calorie, nutrient dense snack if you can get over the fact that it just tastes vile. Last but not least, I wanted to talk about the fact that so often I hear keto is the best diet to follow for fat loss. And actually you could replace the word keto with any fad diet because they all claim to be the best. And I have two words for you here. And if you take one thing away from this video, please let this be it. Calorie deficit. You can be on whatever diet you wanna be on, whether that's keto, whether that's paleo, whether you're going to Slimming World or Weight Watchers or any of those things. But the key principle behind all of these is the same. You will lose weight if you are consuming less calories than you are expending, being in a caloric deficit, calories in versus calories out. What I have a problem with is certain diets claiming that cutting out carbs or eating only raw foods is the key to being fit and healthy and lean. And actually, while we're here, I wanna address the topic that carbs are bad for you. I see so, so many people rave about the keto diet. And for anyone that's unsure of what the keto diet is, keto standing for ketogenic, it's basically a diet that emphasizes a very, very little amount of carbs with the idea that you get more calories from protein and fats. The principle behind this is that you'll be eating less of the easily digestible carbohydrates, such as sugar, fizzy drinks, sweet treats, pastries, white bread, all those kind of things. Now, this is where so many people go wrong and misconstrue the idea. Cutting out carbs is not the key to your weight loss and carbs are not inherently bad foods. Just like we spoke about the different types of fats, there are different types of carbs that serve different purposes within the body. And carbohydrates are an essential part of the human diet. So before we just rule that carbs are bad because someone told us, we need to ask ourselves, how much do we really know about the different types of carbohydrates and the importance that they play within our bodies? And just like fats, there are some sources of carbohydrates that are healthier and better for you, such as whole grain bread and brown rice and sweet potatoes, all of which are considered whole sources of carbohydrates. Okay, back to keto. Essentially, by cutting carbs, it's highly likely that you will be eating less than your normal daily diet. It's likely that you are consuming fewer calories than you are expending. And guess what this does? Puts you in a caloric deficit. And guess what that means? you're gonna lose some weight. So it's not carbs that are the bad food group and cutting them out is not what's causing you to lose weight. It's the fact that you are now in a caloric deficit that you weren't before. And you can easily do this still having carbs in your diet. It's all about being aware of what you're eating and how many calories you're expending a day. So I cannot express to you enough the importance of understanding, and I mean really understanding, A, the principle of weight loss through caloric deficit, and B, the importance of doing your research before trying any fad, any diet, any supplement that influencers and companies are pushing and promoting. Because often they don't have your best interests at heart, and they're just interested in pushing and selling their products, whatever it takes. I can guarantee you that any diet you go on has the same principle behind it, calorie deficit. No matter what the rules are, no matter what you are and aren't allowed to eat, the principle is the same. You will be eating less than you are expending and therefore you will lose weight. And that's it. A lot of research went into this video because I wanted to make sure that the facts I was giving you were correct. 
So if you haven't already, please give this video a big thumbs up. And if you want to see a part two, let me know down in the comments below. I have so many more myths that I'm ready to debunk if you want to hear them. If you haven't already, please make sure you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. It massively helps me to grow my channel and it also means that you don't miss out. That's all I have for you today, my friends. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Your support means the absolute world to me and I will see you in the next video. Thank <laughs> you.